Okay, so we're going to talk about jump genomics today. I'm going to start these slides. We'll do some of this from a PowerPoint slides and some of it popping into the software. Because genomics processes take a little longer to run, I can't do everything live, so I'll show you some of the output and results and sort of talk through what you want to do in jump genomics, but we'll also take a bit of a tour inside of the software. So. Our agenda today is to talk a little bit about just why would you use jump genomic software, what sort of situations would make that useful. Then we'll look at two examples in some detail, a gen genome-wide association study for genetic data and an expression analysis for microarray expression data. I'll allude to a few other resources out there on some predictive modeling for these types of situations. So predictive modeling, for example, for plant breeding and what you can do with that and predictive modeling for um, well, actually for the expression analysis example that we're going to look through is a breast cancer data. We have, um, I'll show you on our website, <clears throat> some step-by-step -step guides walking through how to do predictive modeling, <clears throat> excuse me, with that data. So I'll, um, I'll point you to some other resources as well, but we're going to focus on um, sort of the basics today. We'll talk about a, a GWAS study and an exp a typical expression analysis. And then I'll also it, throughout sort of woven in and then a bit more at the end uh, purposefully give you a brief tour of what's in the software so we can look through what the options are uh, and I'll kind of talk about briefly how it works, how you enter things into jump genomics and how you get these processes to run. And then I'll also point you to some of these resources where to get help and other step-by-step -step guides and things that you can use to learn about the particular processes that you want to run. So I would say two incredibly wonderful reasons to use jump genomics. One is if you have genomics data and you're running a bunch of analyses, you'll save a lot of time if you can use these uh, routines that automate things. So I've come across some um, academics who've been running one test at a time, one ANOVA at a time, one marker at a time. You will save so much time in comparison to that because jump genomics processes will automate all of that. So you'll run all of the tests simultaneously, save a ton of time. But even if you're using other software, there's a lot of things that Jump Genomics can do that can speed up your process. If you're spending a lot of time doing data cleaning, which all of us are, that's a huge part of doing any data analysis is the data cleaning, Jump Genomics has a bunch of built-in routines that can help speed that up quite a bit for you. And also, because Jump Genomics is part jump, so I'll just pause for a moment to tell you that there's kind of two software packages working together for Jump Genomics. Jump is like the front end of it. So if you've been a Jump user, if you are a Jump user, it has those wonderful dynamic graphics where if you click on one point, you see that point highlighted everywhere else. Or if you choose a group of points, you see those points highlighted in every other plot, everything else that you have open. So that dynamic graphic aspect makes it really easy to find connections and insights. But then also Jump Genomics has SAS the SAS software running in the background to help speed up those heavy duty workhorse sort of routines. So Jump Genomics is a hybrid software that's using Jump as sort of the front end and then SAS behind the scenes. So the other point as a statistician, this matters a great deal to me is we want to use appropriate statistical methods. We don't want to just use the software that's available that just does a simple unadjusted t-test. So if uh, you're looking for appropriate statistical methodology, there's a, a huge depth in jump genomics. For example, instead of doing a bunch of single tests by hand and trying to adjust them by hand for the fact that you're doing lots of multiple comparisons, that's really easy to do in jump genomics. You do all the tests simultaneously and you tell it what kind of adjustments you'd like to make. For example, the false discovery rate. You also can choose from a wide range of tests for simple situations like t-tests or tests of association. You can get more in depth. We're going to look at a QK mixed model today for a GWAS and also advanced predictive modeling, internal marker reduction options. So let's say you want to build a predictive model for breast cancer for classifying pe if people are likely to have breast cancer or not. You probably don't want to include all of your possible um, probe sets or markers. So internal variable reduction will help you build a model on the fewest but most powerful markers possible so that when you collect data on patients, you're not needing to run every marker. So a lot of these tools exist in the software. Cross-validation when you're um, running predictive models, you want to run it on a training set and then test it on a test set. And so there's a lot of ways to do that built into Jump Genomics. And in plant breeding, if you build a predictive model and then you'd like to generate uh, progeny, simulate the, the um, 
what would happen in the next generation. So pick out the best possible crosses and then simulate what happens if you make those crosses. You can do this multiple generations down the line so you can actually see in silico basically what would have happened in the field. So let's begin with a genome-wide association study. So this is genetic data. We have SNPs, so single nucleotide uh, polymorphisms. Oh boy, I, I shouldn't use the biology language because I'm a statistician all the way. Um, so we're looking at individual, um, what is the, the individual gene in that, or not gene, the individual marker in that spot. So the SNP, the single allele. So you're getting, uh, for something like this dog example, or for humans, you're getting one copy from each parent. And so then we know, are you homozygous for one of the alleles? Are you homozygous for the other allele? Or are you heterozygous? So this is the kind of data that we have. And we're looking at an association between all these SNPs and whether or not the dog, in this case, so we're looking at Bernese mountain dogs, whether or not the dog has this particular type of cancer. So this study was first published in 2012. The authors are credited here at the top of this slide. And the point is looking at uh, what SNPs are associated with cancer versus non-cancer. I got the data from the GEO website, so the Gene Omnibus Gene something omnibus uh, website. So there's a lot of data posted on this website, and a lot of uh, our examples that, that I'll show you at the end of this webinar are, are linked to things that you can download yourself from the GEO website. So this particular data, uh, again, were posted around 2012, May 16, 2012. And I can get the files of, of the raw data from these download family options, and there's some extra information in the supplementary file. So I grab the data from this website, and then I do a small amount of processing and manipulation to get it into this stage. So I need something for jump genomics that looks like this. This is uh, the genotype information starts from about like 10 or 12 columns in where it says SNP1, SNP2, SNP3. And it's coded the way that the, the data were coded that I brought down, this is the, the, the raw coding that I've got, is AA and BB to indicate if they're the major allele or the minor allele. So that's homozygous for either the major allele or the minor allele. Major just meaning the one that's the most common in this population. And then AB is the heterozygous. So I've got all this genetic data and I've got it in this format. There are many types of formats that it could come in, but what Jump Genomics needs is a numeric format. So we're going to use some tools in Jump Genomics to change that, just one click, change it into numeric coding, where the uh, minor allele gets a 2 if it's homozygous for the minor allele, homozygous for the major allele gets a 0, and heterozygous gets a 1. So we want to end up with this 0, 1, 2 coding. And the other things in this data set are some information on um, the experimental design, essentially. So what do we know about these, these dogs? The array column is just numbering. So we have 474 dogs, and then we have the names of those samples in the array name, and actually that's kind of repeated in the column name and in the title. So some of this is a bit repetitive and, and not strictly necessary, but this is the way it read in when I brought it into Jump Genomics. The second data set that we have is an annotation data set. So this is optional. But if you have annotation data, you can associate that as you're working through processes in Jump Genomics, and the, association, the, the annotation data will stay associated as you make changes, as you filter things. So you'll end up uh, at each stage sort of carrying this information along, and when you get to a point that you're ready to go back out to a pathway analysis or something like that, Jump Genomics can help you send that data to third-party software to do that type of analysis. So here's what we've got in the annotation data, things like which chromosome, what, what the position on the chromosome is, et cetera. Okay, so we start by looking at things like how to clean up the data. So I mentioned that we want to recode the genotypes. We also have some missing genotypes that come in with a certain missing code, and SAS is going to require that missing code uh, be a different code. So we're going to recode the missing. We're going to recode the genotypes into numeric. Look at marker properties. Just look at sort of distributions of the major allele, the minor allele, what's, what's happening in those markers. And then we'll look at some um, missing by trade, and we'll subset and reorder the data so that we end up cleaning the data. So this is a whole bunch of steps of cleaning the data. 
to recode the missing genotypes, you can see the way the data read in, if you look at that SNP uh, 8383, missing came in as this NC code. That's going to be a problem for Jump Genomics running it, so we need to replace that missing code with just a blank. So to, that's a really easy one step. There's a button that says recode missing, and we just say what was it, what was the missing code, and what will the missing code be for us now. Once we've recoded that, so now we get these little dots indicating it's missing in the data table, now we recode the genotypes to make it numeric. So the homozygous for the minor allele we become a 2, for the major will become a 0, and for heterozygous will become a 1. And then we look at those marker properties, and we do a lot of filtering on this. So let's look at that a little closer. So we get a distribution from chromosome 1 at the top there of the minor allele frequency across all the SNPs. So we maybe don't want things that are, have a rare variant. There are processes in jump genomics to deal with rare variants, but this standard GWAS doesn't want rare variants. We don't want an incredibly unlikely grouping to happen. So we might want to filter out the things that are pretty rare. So when the minor allele frequency is really low, so you can see on the left panel, there are filters. So I can set the cutoff for the minor allele frequency to be, for example, it has to be at least 5%. I need to see that minor allele at least 5% in the data. I can also do a cutoff for the proportion of missing genotypes for the markers. So any SNP that's missing more than 10% of the samples, so at least 10% of the samples didn't somehow uh, code that SNP, then I would get rid of those uh, markers. I would say that's not enough information in that marker to be useful in my analysis. I can also use a cutoff for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium if that pertains to my situation. And then below the filters for markers, there's a filter for individuals. So just like I can filter out SNPs that have a lot of missingness, I can also filter out uh, samples, individual dogs that had a lot of missingness. So if it's more than 10% that's missing for this dog, then I don't want to use that dog in the sample. And once I do this, I get a little um, pop-up from SAS that tells me, okay, in your original genotype data set, you had 22,362 markers. In your new data set, you have 13,684. We've excluded 8,678, and we also excluded 10 of the, the dogs, 10 samples. So now it just brings the annotation and the original data together deletes all that extra information and gives me new data sets. So then it gives me a piece of output that tells me what are the names of the new data sets. So that first thing that says the, on my C drive, on my desktop, in this BMD folder, here's, here's where I have this new uh, data set that has excluded all these things that I wanted to clean out. And there's the associated annotation. And if I just wanted to explore later on who were the excluded markers, I have an extra data set for that as well. So. If I'm picking and choosing processes from Jump Genomics, I now know which data sets I should use to put into my next process. Alternatively, I can choose a workflow where the data that I'm creating, I'm reading in at the beginning, just keeps being passed without me having to pass it myself through from stage to stage to stage. So you've got a couple of ways to use Jump Genomics. One is with workflows where everything is like a pipeline and it's almost hands off. You make decisions at the beginning and then the software pushes the data through from pipeline to pipeline. Or if you want more autonomy over that process, then you can use these um, clues that it gives you. It's, each process tells you here's where the output data is, and then you take that output data and feed it into the next piece. So the next piece we would want to do is an actual test. We've cleaned up our data. Now we would like to do that association analysis. So for this example with a binary trait, so our trait is do they have cancer or not, we have three really good options for this in a GWAS sort of context. One of them is a case control. So this is a very simple test where we just look, the trait has to be cases and controls. That's what we've got, so that's a possibility for us. Another option is the SNP trait association. This is um, like a bigger, it's like the daddy version of case control. So this allows case control analysis, but it also allows other types of traits. So you could have more than just a case and control. You could have several levels in the variable, or you could even have a continuous trait. And QK mixed model is 
the daddy version of that, the even bigger pot, which allows a new way of incorporating extra information with this cue and case. We'll talk a bit more about that in a second. So case control is like, if this was a Venn diagram, QK mix model holds everything. SNP trait is a subset of QK mix model and case control is a subset of SNP trait. Case control is with a binary trait, SNP trait is with a categorical or a continuous trait, and QK is with a categorical or continuous trait, but a more complicated model. So if we did a case control, we would look at the association between those numeric genotypes, the 0, 1, and 2, compared to what, what's the distribution of 0, 1, and 2 for the cases versus the control. So on the right-hand panel, you can see a picture of a distribution for a particular SNP that uh, for the cases, there were lots of zeros, so lots of homozygous minor or major. For the controls, we had lots, lots more proportionally homozygous minor for the controls. So there's a, a difference in the distribution there for the cases and controls of those three types of genotypes we could have for that SNP. So we can do this as a genotype test, which treats the genotype groups as groups and does a chi-squared type of test because you're doing a group variable against a group variable. Or it could be a trend test, which is treating that 0, 1, and 2 kind of like it's continuous. And so this is a Cochrane-Armitage type of a test. So you get the option for both the genotype test and the trend test when you're looking at, these out, at this output. The SNP trait, same kind of concept, but it, you don't just have to have two groups. You could also have more groups than two, and you could have a continuous trait. So same kind of idea. So in any of these models, in the case control or the SNP trait, if we want to control for or include other variables in the model, we can include them as effects in the model. So we have a fixed effect or a random effect option. So if you know much about mixed models, mixed models just means they could, you have fixed effects in them and random effects. A fixed effect is where you really care about exactly what is the mean for that effect, for each level of that effect. A random effect is usually something where you care more about controlling for variation because of that. So you're not as interested in doing comparisons for the levels of a random effect as, as you would be for a fixed effect. So for example, in, in our situation, we have the variable origin, where the dogs came from. So I'm gonna pop out of the slides and let's look. So this is what jump genomics looks like. It's open on my desktop. We'll explore it a bit more in a little bit. But let's look at the data for this example. So one great thing about jump genomics is when you have this starter window open for jump genomics and that stays open in the background as long as you have jump genomics open, you can just drag data sets on top of this. So I'm gonna take that um, data set that it describes the variables. And in this data set, so we saw this in a slide already. So I just drag it on top of the, the starter window and it opens. And uh, one thing that can be a little confusing when you're starting to use jump genomics is that generally uh, I, you're going to look at data sets in jump, but they're saving as SAS data sets. So I'm opening this in jump. I'm looking at the data in jump, but the actual data set itself, let's look back in the folder, is a SAS 7bdat file extension. So it's actually a SAS data set because jump and SAS work together so well. It, I can easily open it and jump, but just keep in mind you want to keep saving it as that SAS data set because that's how it's going to run is internally through SAS. So if I use some of the jump things from the jump menu bar, like analyze and distribution to explore some of these variables, let's just grab everything. Let's look at everything. So I'm going to look at a distribution of all of these variables. So the array itself, this is not all that interesting, so I'll just remove this. The array name, just all each each dog has its own name so I'm not that's not that interesting to me I'll remove that title also just everybody has their own name uh, file does not look all that interesting I'll remove that column name does not look all that interesting um, this one with breed everybody's a Bernese mountain dog so that's not that interesting so I'll remove that one also and let's see uh, tissue everybody is from a whole blood sample so I'll remove that and this intensity, everybody is VAR2. This is something unique to, to reading in the data. I'll remove that also. So we're left with the interesting things so far are the source, the phenotype, and the origin. If I click on something, like I click on the whole blood, the controls, 
you can see that these data are highlighted in every other plot. And this lets me see really quickly that the controls from the source are exactly the same as the unaffected in the phenotype. Just to confirm, if I check on the case, that's having the cancer here. So the source variable and the phenotype variable, I can see really quickly they're exactly the same information. So I could get rid of source and just keep phenotype. So this is it, that all of those columns in that data set, this is really the interesting stuff for this example. This Bernese Mountain Dogs really has the phenotype, which is the trait of interest, and the origin is the only other variable that might be of interest to us. If we explore the origin a little bit more, we can see that there are only two dogs that came from Denmark, one that came from Germany, one that came from Switzerland, five from Italy. So there are some groups here that have very low numbers, very low counts. The ones that have just one, that's going to be really hard to estimate anything because we can't get variance estimates from just one in a group. But even two or five, these are really small numbers to do any good kind of estimating. So this tells me that if I want to include origin in the model, I might want to group some of these categories together. I might need to do something with these data to make this a little more useful. So if I go to analyze, uh, sorry, if I go to columns and um, let, let me check this column first. So let's find this column. So let's click on origin either in the column list or in the columns and then go to columns and recode. Here I can make a choice about how I want to regroup these. So I see that North America has lots of dogs, and then I see all these individual country names in Europe. So maybe I'll just call them North America versus Europe. So if I want to change this to Europe, I can type that here, and then I can just keep typing it. And you can see that as I drop it in as the replacement for Denmark, Denmark and France grouped together into Europe. And I'll do this with Germany. I'll do this with Italy. I'll do it with Switzerland, and I'll do it with the Netherlands. So now I've got all of these countries coming into this new group called Europe, North America, staying North America, and I can click Done and either replace them right where the column is, but then I lose the original information. So if I wanted to go back and consult that later, I would have a problem. So I usually do this as a new column. Formula column also makes a new column, but it applies the, the matching formula, the recoding formula, so that if I had new data, I could also really quickly apply this formula and it would just recode it for me. But for, for this case, I don't have any new dogs. I, I will be getting no new samples, so I'll just say new column. So now at the very end of the data set, it has origin two, which is my North America versus Europe. Okay, so now if I wanted to, I'm going to go back to the not make any changes. I'll go back to the slides and we'll keep going here. So the origin I could include in a SNP trait association or a case control analysis, I could now include origin North America versus Europe as, for example, a fixed effect where I could test what are the differences between the, the two groups or as a random effect where I'm kind of just explaining variation. Another way to treat origin is to use this QK mixed model where instead of putting origin in as a factor, as a fixed or random effect, I create matrices that talk about how correlated, how related to each other these uh, the SNPs are for the dogs from the, the origins that are similar, and I include those matrices of information as something to control for in my model. So a QK mixed model has a Q piece, a K piece, plus the mixed model, where you could put fixed and random effects if you want to. So the mixed model part is very similar to the SNP trait, but the Q and K is the new thing. The Q matrix is looking at the overall population structure. The K matrix is looking at a finer grained relationship matrix. So let's look closer at this. If I want to do a QK mixed model, there is a workflow in Jump Genomics. So I get this whole pipeline. It just carries the data from, from step to step for me, and I don't have to touch it. I just set up everything I want at the beginning, and it runs it all through. So I'm going to use that workflow. So first it'll do that PCA for population stratification. This is a process that I could pick individually or it's part of this workflow. And that's the part that's going to give me the Q. Then I'll do the relationship matrix. That's the part that will give me the K. Then I'll do a K matrix compression if I want to help speed this up a little bit because QK mixed models get a lot slower. And then I'll actually do the QK mixed model analysis. So when I do the Q part, 
here's what I see. I do a PCA, a principal components analysis, and I see North America is that like weird mustard colored, yellowish, greenish color. So I can see that separates quite a bit on these principal components um, from the other countries. That blue color is the Netherlands, and that orangey red color is France. That's where we also had a lot of dogs from. So you can see that they're much more similar to each other, but different from North America. So we can see there is, in fact, an origin effect. What is happening with the SNPs, the distribution in the SNPs is different for the different origins. So we can capture that with that principal components analysis. We can also capture a finer detailed version of that with this relationship matrix. So IBD stands for identity by descent. It's the method that's being used to see just how related these dogs are to each other. Again, you can see that mustard colored clump on the bottom right hand side. So here, this mustard colored clump, this was the North American dogs. A few of them got misclassified into other or or classified because of identity by descent into other groups. But for the most part, North America clustered here, so higher correlations with each other. So this darker green area, this was the North American dogs. This bigger area was all the European dogs. This small or sort of medium-sized darker area, that was the, the blue ones. I think that was the Netherlands. And I think the reddish color was France. So we can see those clustering together also. So we have these two matrices with all this detail about the origin and how the origin affects the SNPs, and we can now control for that. We also, when we do that IBD identity by descent, we also can see this uh, picture of any dogs that are really highly related. So in this case, we actually had three points, three dogs that were around 100% related. So that might suggest that we've got accidental duplication. Maybe we ran the same sample a couple times accidentally. So this is another just sort of check on data, um, data quality. So in this case, I can delete things that I think might actually be the same dog. Once we've built that Q and that K, now we're going to put them into our QK mixed model analysis. This is some of the output we're going to get from that. We're going to look at um, we'll look at this more closely. So we'll get something called a Manhattan plot. Each point in this plot is one of the tests. Each point is one SNP being associated with the trait. So it's, uh, if the trait is categorical, it's like a chi-squared kind of a test. So each point is telling us this SNP was significantly differently distributed for that particular, for that trait, the, the drug the case versus the control had a different distribution on that SNP. You can see that on the bottom we have these numbers. These are the chromosomes. So chromosome 11, we've got lots of significant and really highly significant values. You'll also see on the y-axis that this says the negative log prob genotype. This is actually the negative log base 10 of the p-value. It's just a function of the p-value that helps us be able to see the detail in the p-value better. So it's just a version of the p-value. We can click on any of those points. We also can see this in the form of a, a volcano plot instead. The volcano plot on the bottom axis, on the x-axis, is showing us the fold change of the effect. On the y-axis, again, it's that version of a p-value. So we want things that are in the top right or left corner top right or left corner of this plot says that they had, they were very significant, the higher they are, the more significant, but the farther out they are, the bigger the actual difference, so the larger the actual effect also. So things up in that corner are the most interesting to us. Anything above that red dotted line is going to be statistically significant according to the adjusted p-values from the test. So if we click on some points, if I click on this point, for example, I can see what is the actual distribution of the genotype for the case versus control for that particular marker, for that particular SNP. Here's all three of those. So I can see that, yes, there is a difference in how many are homozygous major, how many are homozygous minor, and how many are heterozygous for these three. There's, there's definitely a difference. These plots are not showing the confidence intervals on that, but all of these were statistically significantly different. We see that from the p-values being so high here. In this, and anything above that red dotted line was statistically significantly different. 
So in summary for this GWAS example, we looked at things like filtering out the SNPs that had low minor allele frequency or missing values. We filtered out samples that had lots of missing SNPs. We were able to look at the source of variation for the origin or relatedness of the dogs. We could account for that in the model, either as a fixed effect or in our QK model with this Q and K matrix. We can look at the effects of the genotypes unique to those groups, so we could put it in as a fixed effect, effect or we, we can account for those differences and then look at how important the SNPs are after accounting for that, which is how we chose to do it. We also identified the SNPs that are associated with that cancer, and we found that most of those markers were on chromosome 11. Uh, that actually turns out to be very interesting in this case, and so the next thing we would want to do after this QK mix model is probably a pathway analysis or, or some further investigation into how these significant SNPs are related to each other. So there's more we could do, but this is a, a nice simple beginning, um, and I'll point you to some resources to sort of see how you would do some of those further steps at the end of this webinar. Okay, our second example is about expression analysis. So now instead of genetic data with SNPs, we have genes or markers of some kind, probe sets, where we're looking at, for example, RNA expression. Um, here we're looking at differences for breast cancer patients. Everyone in our data set now has breast cancer. We're not looking at cancer versus non-cancer, but we're looking at other endpoints. So these data were published in 2010. Uh, I, again, I pulled these off of GEO. And one of the endpoints in this case is to predict complete response versus residual invasive cancer after treatment. So the, the patients are treated, and then we know if they have no more cancer or if there is some residual invasive cancer. There are some really nice step guides I'll point you to on our website that show you how to do this analysis. Another endpoint that we're going to look at today is the um, estrogen receptor status. So we can look at which uh, genes or markers are associated with estrogen receptor status in breast cancer patients. These are Affymetrics data, so we're going to use tools for uh, Affymetrics. There are many ways to read in data for, for specific kinds of platforms, and so it's pretty easy to get these data into JUMP. Here we have uh, the samples in this data set are the columns, so instead of in, in our previous data set for the GWAS, we had the markers, the SNPs in the columns. That was a wide data set. Now we have a tall data set where we have the samples as the columns and we have those probe sets as the uh, rows. So we have 22,283 probe sets or markers. and We have 278 samples that read in in this case. We also have the data set that describes the experimental design. So again, we have that array number, which is just counting the samples. We have the name of the sample. Uh, we have things like the age, the race, the estrogen receptor status, and so on about these patients. But in this case, there, there are more variables, so we might want to again explore them. And, and we might want to look at, um, for example, You'll notice in this description, it says that there are 230 patients, but we have 278. So we might want to explore, do we have duplication of information? How, how did we end up with 278 patients when GEO website that we took the data from says 230? So we want to do a little bit of exploration. So again, let's pop out and let's look at these data. So the original data were this series matrix. I pulled this down. So if I open this one, this was the original data. And then the, um, and I'll close this one again, and the experimental design is described in this one. So here's our data. And again, we could go to analyze and distribution and grab some things. Array and array name I already know and title are going to be um, not that interesting. Bio column name. So let's start maybe with tissue down to histology. Whoops. And explore these guys. Okay, so tissue was not interesting. Everything was breast cancer cells. So we'll remove that. Age is interesting. 
that might be something that we want to account for. There are ways we can account for it. And so one thing we could do is divide this into age groups. So if I wanted to, um, so you'll notice that the age, right now the jump table, because it's actually a SAS table in the background, is calling this categorical. If I change this to continuous, I can actually see the percentiles and where things cut off so I can make some decisions about where to cut it. So I might turn this into age groups. I could use recode or a bunch of other tools to, to divide up this into groups. Uh, I might also want to include race to control for race. So age and race are two things that I might want to control for in my model. The race, again, we have a problem of not many observations in some of the categories. So one thing I could do here is to split this into white is obviously a very dominant category here. So maybe white versus other. That's going to um, gloss over any differences that we would be able to find between other races. So this may not be the right choice. On the other hand, we don't have a lot of data for the other groups. So we have to make a choice about what we want to do here. If we'd like to control for race, maybe the choice with the most statistical power is white versus other, but there may be reasons we don't want to do that. So we can make some choices here. Uh, estrogen receptor status is positive or negative. And this is something that I called out on this slide. There's actually, there's a nice article about um, where really should be the threshold for estrogen receptor positivity. It could be at 1%, it could be at 10%. So we could also create a variable, and that's what I did for this analysis I'll show you. I created an estrogen receptor status, so there's another variable a little farther along that's just the actual estrogen receptor value from that test. So I could set the cutoffs at 1% and 10% and then have low, moderate, and high estrogen receptor status instead of just positive or negative. And we could test, is there a difference for those that are in that moderate group? So that's what we're going to look at today. Um, again, we've got a bunch of other variables. We can explore a lot of things here, but for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over some of this. So there's some interesting stuff in these data, some more mistakes to find. In the process of finding some of these mistakes, we had to clean out the data a little bit. So the data that I'm going to run this on is not quite all of these observations. I never did figure out exactly um, how to get to 230 with this. I think I ended up with 200 and 48 or something like that. I think I got rid of a bunch of these that were duplicates, but I, I wasn't able to completely solve this mystery. So if anyone wants to play around with this data and figure out who are the 230 legitimate patients, that'd be awesome. Okay. So um, moving into an expression analysis, there is a nice workflow, a single pipeline workflow to do a lot of this. So we get the data in, we import the data, and then we can do a distribution analysis. So looking at the expression, we can normalize the expressions. Sometimes things, a, a sample might just have higher fluorescence. There might be some reason that there's um, a higher expression for the whole sample. So everything seems overexpressed in one sample. If we normalize that, we kind of mute that signal, then we might believe that we're actually making the, the samples more comparable to each other. So this is a very common technique with expression data is to normalize or standardize the data. We have different tools for microarray data versus um, uh, RNA-seq data. Microarray data has fewer options. RNA-seq data has, has quite a few options. Uh, then we would do a correlation and principal variance components analysis just to explore what features are there, what do we, what can we explain, what are we able to see effects of, and then once we've done a lot of exploration, we go into an ANOVA test. We can also do things like predictive modeling from biomarker discovery, so there's a nice example, as I mentioned on our website, I can point you to for this. We can do hierarchical clustering, more principal components analysis, cross-correlation, subgroup analysis, so there's lots of other things we could do as well. We're going to stick with this uh, pipeline today. So here is this basic expression workflow. The first thing it does, number one, distribution analysis. This is looking at the raw expression values. Then number two, correlation and principal variance component analysis is exploring that data. Then we decide, should we normalize? Do we want to use a normalization method? We standardize the data based on the normalization method we chose, and then we redo one and two again. So we re-explore the data. We look at the distribution analysis again. We look at the correlation and principal variance component analysis again after the uh, standardization. This is a great 
tool, the fact that we see the exploration before and after is really helpful for understanding if the method you choose for normalization is having a big impact on your results. So if you are concerned about the method of normalization impacting your results, try it with and without and see, do your results seem to be wildly different? What kind of things are different? Which markers end up being different? And you can continue to explore that. And then the last thing and the point of this is once we've got everything clean and the way we like it, then we run an ANOVA analysis to see which markers are expressed differently for our two groups, cancer versus, or sorry, uh, estrogen receptor status. Although in this case, I think we're looking at three groups. Okay, so before normalization, here's the parallel plot showing that the kernel density estimate. So this is the, di the distribution of the expression over the, all the probe sets. Each line is one sample, and the samples are colored by the three groups I'm gonna look at, the three estrogen receptor status groups. The low, 1% or lower, the moderate, 10% down to 1%, and the high, the truly um, the uh, estrogen receptor uh, positive group. So low is definitely negative, high is definitely positive, and moderate is the one that, which, which should we classify that as? So the blue lines, you can see a few blue lines at the very top, those were from the low group, but mostly everything is sort of intermixing. They, they are spread out though. So this is a distribution of the expression across all of the probe sets. If we normalize this, I chose an interquartile range normalization, and it took it from this, to this. So you can see that we're pulling things closer together so that we believe that everybody has a general amount of expression. And now which probe sets created the higher expression is going to be more interesting now that we've got decided that everybody has a similar amount of overall expression. We can still choose to click on points. So if I, well, let me make this much larger for us. So if I click on this blue line that's sort of a little bit more abnormal compared to everything else, I can then click on the button, create subset experimental design data, excluding selected curves. So I can click on as many outliers as I want to, and then I can create a new data set without those. So if I normalized and it still didn't fix some of my problems, I can still exclude those samples. I can also look at the variance component. So in my model, I said, okay, I think this estrogen receptor with the three groups is interesting. I want to put that in my model. So I'd like to see how much of my model that explains. I think the race recoded as white and non-white might be interesting. So let's just see what, how much that explains. And I think the age groups, I put them into three age groups, younger than 45, 45 to 60, and older than 60. Those were kind of thirds of the, the data. So let's see if that makes any impact. And it looks like our model is not a great fitting model. We are not explaining almost 95% of what's going on in our expression, but we are explaining something. And so we're going to explore that a little bit farther. And in fact, we're going to find a lot of significant relationships. We can also see when we get principal components for these um, so we're trying to capture the variability in fewer dimensions. And we can see that principal component two, this plus sign one, that explains a lot of the ER status. A lot of the estrogen receptor status is explained in principal component two. So we can explore that a little bit farther. Remember the red dots are the samples that had uh, positive estrogen receptor status. The blue was negative and the gray was that moderate group in between. You can see in the scatter plot on the left, which I can rotate, I can just click in that scatter plot and rotate it, so I spun it around for the second view. But you can see that the, the points are kind of separated and they're specifically really separated on that principal components too. So principal component two was the principal component, the dimension of the data that really explains the estrogen receptor status. It splits the data, so red's on one side and blue's on the other, basically. So we can see there is something, expression is different based on that estrogen receptor status. And so we can keep exploring that further. Here's another way of looking at that principal components analysis. Again, we see the red really pulling away from the blue, especially in principal component two. So if you look at that second row, they really get separated. And we can look at more about that principal components analysis. Again, each line or point is one of the samples. For the Mahalanobis distance, this is an outlier analysis, and so I, that little dotted blue line is sort of indicating where we think they should all fall below. 
nothing is very far above that line, so I'm not too worried, but I could click on a point like this one, which um, says this is array GSM 505536. If I wanted to exclude it from the analysis, I can click on it and I can remove that from the data. We can also look at the heat map and dendrogram of the correlations from this uh, correlation and principal variance components analysis. Again, the points are colored on this side by red was positive estrogen receptor status, blue is negative, and gray is that moderate in-between group. We can see that a lot of red have grouped together in this chunk at the bottom. So there's a similar relationship here. Some red have grouped together at the top, but there's not full differentiation here. We see a little highly correlated group here that's all red, but then the group outside of that includes some blue. So we're getting some differentiation, but not um, it's not a really strong signal in this case. And then the big ta-da, we did all of that exploration so that we could end up with an ANOVA. Again, we get volcano plots. Each point is one test. So it's looking at one probe set. And for that probe set, uh, was there a difference in the expression in that probe set for the uh, high versus low for this top part, high versus moderate for the next, and then um, moderate versus low for the third. All of these p-values, we're, we're getting the adjustments we're asking for, so that red dotted line is the cutoff after adjusting for the false discovery rate. So everything that's above the red dotted line is significant. So there were a lot of markers that are significant for high estrogen receptor status versus low, so truly positive versus truly negative. I've also selected a few points in these plots, and I'll show you what those are in a second. So I can ask for a Venn diagram. That's one of the options from, if you look on the, the left panel, there's a bunch of drill down things I can do. Under determine significance, it says I can choose a Venn diagram. So if I look at a Venn diagram, it shows me how many markers were significant for all those three comparisons I'm making. So the pink circle, is how many markers are significant for the high estrogen receptor status versus the low. So there's tons over there. The green circle is high versus moderate, and the blue circle is low versus moderate. And I've clicked on the 27 markers that are only high versus moderate, not anything else, and the five markers that are high versus moderate, but not high versus low. So those 27 plus five, so 32 markers, are the markers that if we classified moderate as low, like low, if we, if we said that moderate, anything up to 10% is estrogen receptor status uh, negative, then those markers, uh, these, are, these are the interesting markers to me. This is sort of like, these are the things that would be different between that moderate group versus the low group. So then I can click on the show selected rows after I choose which markers I want to see. And now I get a data table that tells me all those probe sets. So I see exactly which markers these are. If I had annotation data associated with this, that would be in this table as well. So I could really easily grab the markers that are interesting to me and then send them on to another analysis, some other kind of annotation analysis. We can also look at just general patterns. So here I just have the, the broad categories of estrogen receptor status, negative and positive, and I've clustered the data. So I used a hierarchical cluster to see who is similar. And so you can see I, I created three clusters and each um, marker on the x-axis is one of the probe sets. So I can see that the average expression for each sample, so the samples are colored by positive or negative, and I can see their expression for those probe sets. So I can see that the cluster three, for example, on this probe set, 216295, cluster three has a lot of lower expression, and these are negative estrogen receptor status. Cluster two has high, and cluster one also has high. So cluster one and two are high on this probe set. Cluster three is low, and one and two tend to be positive, and three tends to be negative. So I can do more explorations. There are just tons of ways I can visualize what's happening differentially in expression between different groups. 
So again, we want to summarize what we've looked at here. We explored the experimental design and covariate information, so other variables like age and race. We found a few discrepancies. We excluded some patients. We created new features like a new race variable, a new age variable, a new estrogen receptor status variable. We normalize the expression data to adjust for differences in the expression reading process. We can always exclude this other strange outlying samples if we need to, and, and that's just sort of part of that pipeline easily for us. We explored the sources of variation in the data. We determined that the age groups and race were not that critical to control for. They really didn't explain very much of the relationships. We looked for patients with similar expression profiles. We did this with the correlation heat map. We did this with the parallel plot on the last slide. And we saw that estrogen receptor status is related to these groupings, that how the patients are similar or different has a lot to do with their estrogen receptor status. And lastly, we found the markers that were statistically significantly differentially expressed for the three estrogen receptor status groups. We saw that few markers differentiate in the moderate zone um, compared to the other zones. Okay, so we've got about eight minutes left in the hour. I want to show you quickly some other resources and places to go for other topics. And I also want to briefly walk through what the software looks like in the process of using it. So first, these resources are um, wonderful. So jump.com slash jump G for jump genomics is a nice site for academics, especially, but anyone who wants to use things in jump genomics, we've got a bunch of um, uh, examples posted there. and um, let me show you really quickly. So this page has a bunch of things for learning or teaching with jump genomics. And so one of the great tools here is at the very top, the step-by-step -step guides to analyses. There's also some recorded webinars, short how-to videos about a couple of topics. Some, if you have resources, we'd love to put your instructor provided resources. We have a few things here as well, other resources for teaching. So here's if you wanted to do a genetics QK, um, like we just did, here are how you could do those pieces separately. So how you could get the K matrix from the uh, process itself, the population structure, the association analysis, or the way I showed you today using a workflow, a little bit about the K-matrix compression. There's a set about um, predictive modeling, so how to import and transpose the data for expression, how to do predictive modeling, how to look at learning curves to determine how many samples you actually need. At, at what point does increasing your number of samples not give you new information? This is incredibly helpful. Um, how to create your test set, and then do your final model performance comparisons. More about importing, and uh, some older step guides are linked here as well for a lot of other topics. So we're in the process of updating a lot of these materials, so this is a great place to go. Uh, also, jump.com slash genomics is the main genomics webpage on our um, the JUMP website. So sorry about my really slow internet. Uh, <laughs> the Jump Genomics website will explain sort of generally what Jump Genomics does and at the bottom of this page. So if you're in any of these categories, so here's sort of seven big areas of research that, that you can do in Jump Genomics and this learn more button at the bottom will take you to more resources. So here's those seven big areas that we work on. And so if you want to, for example, watch this webinar with Russ Wolfinger on genomic selection for plant breeding, if that's of interest to you, this is a great webinar and a great example. So there are more resources linked to specific things um, on this website as well. Okay, last thing. Let's look at the software briefly. So this is what Jump Genomics looks like. When you open it, it opens with this starter window. It has the Jump toolbar along the top, but it also has this Genomics menu option. The Genomics menu option should look exactly like this list of categories to the side. It's the same thing. So you can either use it from the menu option or you can use it from this starter window. In any case, generally where you start is import. So if you've got, for example, Affymetrix data, there's lots of ways to bring cell files or different types of files into Jump Genomics. If you've got just text data, there's even ways to just bring in text. 
if you've got Illumina data, if you've got next-gen sequencing, proteomics, there's a bunch of different types of tools, uh, Tassel GBS, Plink, uh, all kinds of tools to bring in data as easily as possible. Also, if you have questions about something, you can always click on these question marks, and that takes you to the section of our help that's discussing those options. Then the next thing that you might be interested in after importing your data is a workflow. That's a nice place to begin using Jump Genomics. And then as you decide you want to be a little more um, autonomous in your options, then you might move into the specific pieces below. So the workflows, I showed you today the basic expression workflow. This is what I used for, the, um, for our expression example with the breast cancer data. And this is what it looks like. You point to an input data set. So from breast cancer, this was if this is my original data set. That was the raw data. I point to that data file. I see a list of my variables. So I want to maybe label by the probe set. I point to an output folder. So I was using subfolders in this folder. That's going to keep everything neat and tidy for you, and it's really important. You'll notice there's asterisks next to the things that are critical. It tells you at the bottom, those are required parameters. So it requires you to tell it an output folder because it's going to dump a bunch of files it's creating into that folder and you're going to need them in one place. Then the experimental design is the next tab. So I point to that experimental design data set. Again, if you have questions about this, you click on the question mark. And that takes you directly to describing what an experimental design data set is and how you can make one. And so there's more things you can click on from here. You can also always click on the process description at the beginning. So this is going to tell you about the basic expression workflow process. What do you need? It gives you some examples, talks through what that, what that is. So you're basically clicking from tab to tab. You're pointing to any data sets you need to. Here's where I had the option to do the distribution analysis and the correlation of principal variance components that we saw in that workflow output. Here's where I chose to do an IQR, interquartile range normalization. If I want to read about these options, there's a question mark here. Way more options for RNA-seq. Uh, here's where I set up my ANOVA. So I put any fixed effects here. I put any random effects here. Class variables is anything that's categorical that I want to reference later on. LS means, if I want to estimate means for a certain fixed effect. So if I put something in fixed effects, I can put it in LS means here. Multiple testing is where I choose which kind of method I'd like to use. And if I have annotation data, I can reference it here. So once you've filled out the pieces of this, and there's question marks and so many things to try to help you with this, then you click Run. And then Jump Genomics would dump a bunch of files into whatever folder you've asked for. So for example, here's me using the workflow one of these times. So it dumped all of these files into this folder. I like to organize them by type and then look for the jump journal. This is the way you look at your output. I just open the journal and this is what I'm showing you in that uh, in our PowerPoint slide. So if I want to look at the distribution analysis, I click on that. Here's that distribution analysis. So there's different tabs. I can click around. I can ask to go to other processes as follow-ups from here. But this is the way that this that the software works. So we're right at the end of the hour. I'm happy to stay on the line for a few extra minutes if you've got questions. I'm, I would be happy to take your questions. Um, you can also always email me. My email is ruth.hummel, R-U-T-H dot H-U-M-M-E-L at jump, J-M-P dot com. So if you've got questions about jump genomics, I'd be happy to answer them. Mia, would you mind letting me know if anyone in, is, is sending you questions in the chat or Q&A? Uh, sure. Actually, we have one question, Ruth. Uh, does jump genomics have methods for rare variants? Yes, absolutely. So under the genetics, there's a bunch of genetics sort of options. The genetic utilities is like recoding and the missing the things we were doing at the beginning. Relatedness nature was m measures is like that K matrix. Uh, genetic marker statistics is a lot of other options, GWAS testing, things like that. Um, but we also have um, uh, rare variant analysis under these. Uh, where is the rare variant analysis? It's not under breeding. We do. The answer is yes. <laughs> great, great. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, um, please uh, please write your questions in the chat panel or in the Q&A panel. Uh, Ruth, we do have a, a, another question 
um, about publishing papers. Do many people publish academic papers using jump genomics? Are there any examples? Yeah, that's a great question that I um, many people have asked me. Um, so if you go to Google Scholar, I spelled that wrong, very scholarly. And on Google Scholar, if you search for, for example, jump genomics, you'll find lots of papers that have referenced using jump genomics as software. So this is a nice place to start to look for other researchers who are also using jump genomics. There are a lot of publications every year. For a while, we tried to keep a list of things we knew about on our website, but I think they stopped doing that in 2013 because we just there was too much to curate. So if you'd like to see some examples, use Google Scholar and just look for jump genomics. Great, great, thank you. Um, one more question about uh, normalization. Um, how can I learn more about the types of normalization and, and when to, to use these different methods? Yeah, great question. Under the, um, let's see, under expression, there are normalization options on their own. So that workflow was pulling from these other pieces of routines. So you can click a, the question mark here to find information in our help. The next gen has more options. And again, you can click on the question mark for help. Also on the uh, jump.com slash jump G webpage, jump.com slash jump G. Under the step guides, um, I believe under importing expression data or in the, in the additional step guides, I think there's a step guide specifically about normalization. So there's a bunch of resources here on our website as well. Great. Any Great. any final questions? Um, yeah, there's there's one question about uh, I teach at a university. How how can I get jump genomics? Yeah, so many universities have jump licenses and or jump genomics licenses. So there are a number of universities that have campus wide jump genomics licenses. It's a, a, a the academic pricing for the software is very very inexpensive. So if you are an academic and um, you want your university to have this software available definitely contact me again. My email is ruth.hummel, H-U-M-M-E-L, at jump.com. Um, so getting in touch with us on the academic team is the way to um, sort of make that happen. If you are at a university and want to know if your university has the software, uh, usually a good thing to check is to look at your, there's usually a software page and like from the IT department maybe that says all the software you could download. So check for it there first. Um, but definitely send me an email. I can also check our system to see if your school has a license. And if you don't, it's, it's really um, not cost prohibitive, and we would love to help get you set up with it.